So the idea that this world, uh, this environment, you could say, that we are currently experiencing is a simulation or a virtual representation of some other actual reality is a perennial a perennial philosophical idea uh, that has been presented by many great thinkers and um, in many ways with many analogies and stories and arguments and um, sort of logical inferences and so much evidence over thousands of years. It's not a, a modern idea like we see in the Matrix movie or something like that. Um, it is, but it's also a sort of heavyweight um, major leagues ontological presentation that different uh, philosophers and thinkers have, have brought over the years. Um, so for example, uh, Plato in his Republic in the third century BC, he gave us the cave analogy, which basically has all the critical components of the simulation theory or the virtual reality model of the universe there. Or uh, Rene Descartes in his ontological presentation at the beginning of the scientific revolution in the Renaissance period, um, Rene Descartes also gave an ontological model of the universe uh, which suggested that this is a simulation. Um, so it's a very interesting and compelling idea and it is the basis of the uh, philosophical presentation that we find in yoga, actually. So Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are uh, generally dated to about um, Patanjali is generally accepted to be contemporary almost with Jesus, somewhere around that time or perhaps in the first century AD. And uh, the Yoga Sutras are assuming um, Sankhya philosophy. So Sankhya philosophy is what in the modern world we call ontology. So ontology, Sankhya, same thing. If you do a yoga teacher training and you have anything to do with... Um, you hear something about Bhagavad Gita or Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, often you'll get some presentation of Sankhya philosophy there. So Sankhya and ontology, what scholars or philosophers or scientists are, are trying to get at there is what actually exists here. What is this? <laughs> what is this? Uh, what is the sort of fundamental, irreducible nature of this environment that we find ourselves in? So, um, perhaps first, uh, I'll give some idea of what ontology is. I know there's many, you know, philosophy students and, and people out there who already know this, but just because many people don't. Um, Ontology is attempting to get at what actually exists irreducibly. So, for example, here is my hand, or we have a, a wall, or a floor, or a ceiling, or a light, or a computer. There's a swimming pool out here behind the window. Uh, there's a painting on the wall. There's a myriad of different mm, manifestations all around me, phenomena, you could say, all around us. These would not be the ontological truth. The ontological truth would be more like um, what we hear about in physics as the sort of unified field. Uh, so I'll give an example of that. Um, so say I have my hand here, and in a philosophical phenomenal sense, that's my hand. <laughs> it appears like a hand. Uh, but if I analyze what are the building blocks, what is this made of? Uh, I guess, um, firstly, you'd come to some sort of anatomy or biology. It's, it's muscles, it's tendons, it's bones, it's skin, something like that. Uh, okay, well, what are they made of? And then um, I guess you're going to come to something like, well, muscles and bones and skin, that's like a lattice work of, of cells uh, in a kind of structure which appears like skin or bone or muscle. 
um, okay, well, what are cells made of? And in this way, we're reducing down, well, what is that made of? What is that made of? What is that made of? So the cells are made of um, organelles or mitochondria or DNA and RNA and all that kind of stuff. Okay, well, what are they made of? Well, they're made of um, uh, chemistry, sort of chains of molecules and things like that. All right, well, what is... What are molecules made of? Molecules are made of atoms. What are atoms made of? Atoms are made of subatomic particles. I mean, what what are atoms? <laughs> According to... Um, so I guess we've gone from sort of the phenomenal appearance of a thing, whether it's the light or the window or the wall or the hand, and then reduced it. Well, what is that made of? What is that made of? And eventually what we get to is a kind of field of energy, a kind of um, three-dimensional uh, array of, of atoms, you could say. So this would be the ontological truth. A thousand years ago, this hand did not exist as a hand, but the field of energy the energy that makes up this hand, the atoms that make up this hand, did exist. And in a thousand years, this hand won't exist. Uh, but the field of energy will. Sometimes we hear about that, like in a high school science class or something. Uh, what is it? Energy, energy is never created or destroyed, only transformed. So when we analyze this environment, uh, upon initial appearance, we see that there is a myriad of, of manifestations of phenomena all around us at all times. And we can analyze that in a million different ways. But as we reduce it and get to the real essential truth of it, we find that we are situated in a field of energy which is uh, transforming and manifesting in different ways over time. So, in quantum physics, um, atoms are described as standing waves. Perhaps we'll also mention that. Um, what is a standing wave? Uh, if we think of waves like in a body of water, like in the swimming pool down there or the beach just over here, um, we get the sense of a wave that is moving in a linear fashion across the surface of a water, of a, a body of water. A standing wave is like a guitar string. So it's held at both ends, and then by plucking the string, you create a vibration. But there's no sense in which it is moving in a linear fashion, you know, off onto the horizon. <laughs> it is standing and vibrating. So atoms in quantum physics are understood, at least from one perspective, as standing waves. That this is a field of energy, a field, an array, a three-dimensional array of atoms that are vibrating at different frequencies, which then appear as solid, liquid, radiant, gaseous matter, uh, and therefore appear to be all the variegated phenomena that we see around us. So ontology, or Sankhya, is trying to get to this sort of fundamental truth. What, what exists here uh, in an eternal, irreducible way? So one thing that exists is this field of energy that we call matter, or mass. Um, of course, we've all heard of Einstein's E equals mc squared. So energy, the E is energy, equals m mass, mass times the speed of light squared. But, but on either side of that equation is energy equals mass. So anything that is taking up space or has weight or is measurable here is, uh, is having some mass, and therefore it is part of this field of energy. So when we analyze this environment that we find ourselves in, <laughs> one thing that we find here is a field of energy. Now, when we look at um, ontology, uh, different presentations have been made. 
but one presentation by René Descartes, uh, not one, uh, there are many that Plato also gives, Aristotle also gives similar ontological model of the universe, um, is that basically what you see here is the interplay of two different fundamental things. One is the field of energy. For example, René Descartes called that res extensa, uh, meaning that which is extended or in space. It takes up space. It's a bit funny language, you know, going back a few centuries in French and <laughs> French and Latin as he's presenting. Um, but we can understand that anything which is taking up space here and the other critical characteristic, it is unconscious or inanimate. So glass and metal and wood, <laughs> this, this whole thing, this whole thing, this array uh, is the field of energy. And then strewn throughout this field of energy are um, individual conscious beings. So even though, just like with matter, there are a myriad of different phenomena, but you can understand them as simply temporary manifestations of a field of energy, we can look at conscious beings and see that currently there's a human, there's a horse, there's trees outside, there's birds in the trees here, there's insects and fish and all these things, but all these things are manifesting consciousness at some level. So ontologically, we would not seek to look at, well, this one's manifesting as a human or in a waking state or a dream state or a deep sleep state, or this one, this conscious being is currently a tree or something like that. We would look for the fundamental universal reality of that. So in the end, what we end up with is an ontological presentation that there is a field of, of inanimate energy here which uh, has the characteristic of being not conscious and taking up space and we have conscious living beings somehow strewn throughout this field of energy and that in a state of sort of meditation or contemplation or thoughtfulness the entire array of everything that we find around us in this environment is basically the interplay of these two energies. Conscious beings in a field of energy. <laughs> so this is an example of an ontological position. Now René Descartes and Aristotle also, they're bringing a third ontological entity, which is, um, for René Descartes, it, it's God. Now, we can understand that René Descartes is coming in the context of uh, sort of Christian, European, mid-Renaissance, beginning of the scientific revolution. So he's using certain language which is appropriate for his time and place and so on. Uh, but he's suggesting that there is something like um, a cause of all causes, or an unmoved mover, as Aristotle is often translated, an unmoved mover, that amongst all this mm, ocean of energy that we find ourselves in, anything that you can point to is the cause of some future effect or the effect of some past cause. And in that sense, this is an ocean of causes and effects. And therefore, Aristotle's argument is that there must be some original cause which explains everything perfectly <laughs> and yet is not caused by anything prior, the unmoved mover, the cause of all other causes. In Sanskrit, that's called sarva karana karanam. Sarva means all, karana means cause. Sarva karana karanam, the cause of all other causes. So we get a sense here, I'm not presenting any of this as truth or untruth, or I'm just presenting some ideas of ontology so that we understand what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, the ontology or the branch of philosophy called ontology or the branch of the yoga literature philosophy, which is called Sankhya. Uh, they're trying to get at what 
exists here in an irreducible, ultimate, eternal way. And they're coming to conclusions uh, like we just had. So having established that as a foundation, let's look specifically at this uh, simulation model, this idea that what we are surrounded in here is a simulation. So many, many people in many, many different historical contexts in different languages with different analogies and so on have presented that this is a simulation. But because they're using different stories, analogies, metaphors, ideas, language, concepts, we can break it down to its um, sort of essential ingredients. The essential ingredients are uh, ontological in nature. There is something like a ground reality. Something like a ground reality exists. There are conscious living beings in that ground reality, situated in that ground reality. And that the nature, the intrinsic nature of these conscious, conscious living beings is that they are experiencing their true self and ground reality, actual reality, through a sensory capacity. So through seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling, and perhaps also through some subtle internal sense. Uh, so there are, in a sense, sort of three components to this ontological presentation or the presentation of Sankhya. Um, they're there in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13. You can check that out too if you like. Um, so there's number one, ground reality. Number two, conscious beings in ground reality that are experiencing their true self and ground reality through a sensory apparatus, through a sensory capacity. They see, hear, taste, touch, and smell it. Then, th then arises, with these first two ontological truths, there arises the potential or the possibility that, okay, well, what if you block the ability of the conscious being to see ground reality? What if you block the ability of the conscious living being to hear ground reality or to perceive ground reality at all through the senses? And instead, or in addition, we then project a simulation of reality uh, into the visual mm, capacity of the conscious being, into the auditory capacity of the conscious being, the olfactory, the tactile, the taste, sense, we sort of um, intercept all the information coming from ground reality into the senses of the conscious being. With a, we block that and we put a simulation of sight, sound, and so on um, into the senses of the living being. This is basically the um, common... Uh, features of all the virtual reality models of the universe. So if we look at Plato now, Plato's cave analogy in the Republic, he takes, theoretically, <laughs> he has taken uh, in his story, you take young children, very, you know, infants, and you take them out of ground reality, in that analogy, the outside world, so they're there in normal human society, the blue sky, the trees, the, you know, whatever. And you put them into a deep, dark cave. So therefore, you are cutting them off from being able to see um, the outside world, to see ground reality. They can no longer hear ground reality. They can no longer taste or smell or touch anything in ground reality. You situate them in a deep, dark cave. And then you play a kind of simulation of reality with, um, you know, a methodology, a low-tech methodology suitable for Plato's historical context, where you have a fire with some sort of puppets moving in front of the fire, and the fire acting as a light shines through the puppets and creates shadows on the wall in front of these uh, persons who are kept in this cave. And they are kept in such a way that they cannot even see their own true self. They cannot even see their own body or each other.
They can only see the simulation displayed on the wall. So you can see how Plato's analogy has all the essential ingredients of simulation theory. You see that in the Matrix movie. Uh, you have a kind of ground reality and something is going on there. Um, in that ground reality, the conscious beings are placed into a kind of dormant sleeping state inside these little sort of like amniotic pods almost, like a womb. And they are in the fetal position there with their senses unable to perceive anything that's around them. And then projected into them through some sort of, you know, computer or something, uh, they are experiencing a visual, auditory, tactile, olfactory simulation of the matrix. <laughs> uh, so like this, and if we go through different people, the most common analogy given over the history of the world is something like, a, um, like what we find in the occult or what we find in Plato, this idea um, of as above, so below. So that is basically the dream the dreams that we experience in the night. So we go into our bedroom at night, we turn down the lights, we make everything quiet, we shut our eyes, we, in other words, we are reducing all the sensory input that we're getting from ground reality to the point where we fall asleep and then we open up the senses to a kind of dreamscape. In that analogy, a simulation of what we experience in waking life and ground reality. So the natural idea that many people have put forward over, you know, thousands of years is that, well, hang on, our waking state is also um, dreamlike in the sense that it's temporary and transitory. Uh, so perhaps this, like uh, scientists tell us, I don't remember so many dreams, but but scientists tell us that when we enter REM sleep, we have dreams one after the other. So the analogy is, is a lifetime, as we experience, say, a human lifetime, is a lifetime also like a dream? And then we go to another lifetime, another lifetime, just as we have a series of dreams in the night, do we have a series of lifetimes which are all in themselves somewhat dreamlike in the sense that they are transient, transitory? And is there... Therefore, some higher order, eternal ground reality, uh, which we can go back to. And you see this idea um, presented in the form of religious traditions, spiritual and wisdom traditions also, that there's something like a divine realm and we have fallen or somehow come down into this situation and that we can go back to that divine realm and it's eternal and beautiful and like that. <laughs> so this idea is everywhere and it's very compelling in the sense that millions and billions of people over thousands of years going back over the horizon of history in as much as we have human history, people have been thinking like this. So it's a very compelling idea to many people and like Elon Musk or Plato or Descartes or uh, Jiva Goswami or Patanjali or Krishna and Arjuna, you know, many, many very intelligent people have thought this as well and presented sort of logical arguments or evidence for this. So <coughs> before we get specifically to how this is presented in yoga, um, we might just touch on a little bit of the science of this. So uh, here's a quote by Niels Bohr. And this is getting at what we spoke about in the beginning, that uh, we see all around us what appears to be all sorts of various manifestations of energy. So the ceiling, the wall, the floor, the window, the painting, the camera, the microphone, the, all these things around me here and around you. And out the window here, I can see trees and birds and insects and the swimming pool and the forest and all that stuff. So it appears to be like that. But when we analyze it and get closer and closer and closer and analyze this, it turns out to be a field of frequencies, a field of energy 
uh, a sort of vibration, a sort of um, three-dimensional display of pixels almost. Now, when we have a scientific theory or a philosophical theory, what we want to do with that, when it's in the theory stage, we don't know if it's true or not. So when you're looking to sort of test a theory, scientific theory, the two basic methods are experiment and observation. So you make a theory, you predict, okay, well then, uh, if we did such and such experiment or such and such observation, and the theory is true, what would we expect that experiment or observation to reveal? So if we think, or if we theorize, we postulate, we consider, perhaps this environment is a simulation, we would expect that on close analysis, we would, we would find exactly that, that this would be some sort of field of light, field of energy, field of an array of pixels. Just like if we are fully absorbed in a movie, so say we, we go into our bedroom or our lounge room or whatever, we open the laptop and we put on a movie. And there's Tom Cruise doing something amazing on the, on the movie screen. So it's Tom Cruise, it's Tom Cruise. Well, hang on one second. <laughs> Let's analyze what we're actually seeing here. Upon consideration, we find that that's not actually Tom Cruise. That's an array of pixels simulating the appearance of Tom Cruise in a two-dimensional display of light. Ah. <laughs> and this is obviously analogous to what we find here. Okay, this appears to be Greg behind the camera. This appears to be my body. <laughs> this appears to be the floor or the light or the window. But on closer analysis, we find, ah, this is like a three-dimensional display of pixels. So this lends weight. This lends weight that to uh, the... Mm, validity of the simulation theory. <laughs> All right. So, um, let's look at the two main yoga texts. Uh, you'll find this theory, simulation theory, or the presentation of Sankhya, that this world is Maya, or a simulation. You'll find that throughout all the yoga literature, and the yoga literature is vast. It is vast. It is a library. It is millions and millions and millions and millions of um, little poems, little shlokas. You could say sentences and paragraphs. It is a tremendous amount of literature that we have inherited from this ancient South Asian Sanskritic sacred tradition, you could say. But the two most popular literatures today, if you just walk into a yoga school or do a yoga teacher training or something like that, you're probably going to get something about Bhagavad Gita or Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or perhaps both. So let's look at those two books. Now, Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. It's in the form of a conversation. It's quite short. And in the 18th chapter, towards the end, so the final chapter, towards the end of the chapter, you get some, a sort of series of conclusive statements. So you've got this conversation going back and forth between Krishna and Arjuna. They're discussing all sorts of things, including, uh, for the most part, yoga. And you're coming to the end of the book, and then there's some, some conclusive statements there. So in chapter 18, text 61, you get this uh, little piece of Sanskrit. Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudhani Mayaya. Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudhani Mayaya. So Sarva, uh, like we mentioned before, Sarva Karana Karanam, the cause of all causes. Sarva means all. So Bhutani um, is a synonym for Jiva. So it means a living being or living beings but specifically referring to living beings in the simulation, experiencing the simulation. So, so Sarva Bhutani, the living beings here, experiencing the simulation. Yantra means machine. Uh, 
Uh, Rudhani means a rider, like a rider on a horse or an elephant or a chariot or a car. Rudhani, so riding on a machine. So all the living beings here are riding on a machine, Maya, made of the illusion, made of the simulation. Um, so there's many statements like this, but you can see how just very clearly, in very plain terms, 5,000 years ago, if the archaeoastronomy is correct, then, you know, I don't want to get into that whole thing, but if the archaeoastronomy is correct and the Mahabharata and the Puranic literature and so on, then this conversation is taking place uh, uh, about 3,000 120 BC or thereabouts. <laughs> so you can see, and certainly it's in that ballpark, certainly we're going well back into the BCs there, whatever is the um, actual date. All that time ago, all the living beings here are riding on a machine made of the simulation, made of illusion. Very clear example. So then in another place, um, maya is described. Well, what is the nature of this maya? What is the nature of this illusory display? Uh, and that is prak um, <laughs> shakti and avaratatmika shakti. Uh, so maya is described as having two shaktis, two powers. Praksait patatmika shakti and avaratatmika shakti, which I struggle to say a little bit. <laughs> so maya, this illusion, this simulation has two powers. And what are they? So praksait patatmika shakti is the ability that maya has to create a seamless virtual experience. So if we consider the modern world today, we go home to our lounge room or something, maybe we buy a, an Oculus or something, a home entertainment VR machine, and we put on the headset. Uh, and again, same as, as in all virtual reality models, we block our vision of the lounge room and around. We can no longer see ground reality. We put on the headset, we can no longer hear ground reality. And then projected into our eyes and ears is a simulation of a visual environment and an auditory environment. Nonetheless, as compelling as that is, and anybody who's put on one of those, it's compelling. Like, even though you know you're in the lounge room and you can feel the carpet on your feet and you can hold onto the chair and, you know, you can feel your own body, nonetheless, it's so compelling, that audio and visual experience that, you know, some monster comes up <laughs> it's, it's hard not to react. Uh, nonetheless, it's not seamless. If our friend is next to us in ground reality and they call out loud enough, we can overhear that. Um, if we touch our arm in ground reality, we can feel that. If we take a drink of water, from that water is coming from ground reality. We can taste that. So it's not a seamless, um, full immersive experience, but it's something. It's still very compelling to the nature of the conscious being. But Maya is Praksepatatmika Shakti. She has the power to create a seamless experience. And that's not so wild an idea in the modern age with people like Elon Musk around. Elon Musk, by the way, you know, the gentleman who uh, is in charge of Tesla and the Mars mission and all that stuff. Um, I just heard him in a recent presentation where he said, he gave some arguments, but he said, there is a one in one billion chance that this world is not a simulation. <laughs> and then he gave some logical argument for that. Uh, so he was doing it with a wry smile. You know, I'm not sure he was in a entirely mm, scientific, serious context there. But nonetheless, that's what he said. There's a one in one billion chance that this is not a simulation. And he gave some argument. So <laughs> you can imagine with people like him and the incredible demand and the incredible capacity and genius of human beings as a whole, when they really get inspired about something, that, you know, if we look how 
virtual reality technology has developed over the last 50 years, we can easily project that 20 years or 50 years or 100 years in the future, perhaps we will be able to create through a neural net or something like that, um, a seamless experience of the virtual world. Now, I also noticed um, when I first left home, my friend Stuart Laird was playing a game called Doom, which I've never played, but I remember seeing him play it on those really old computers. <laughs> and I noticed when I turned on my YouTube channel today that I saw that um, some new Doom game is coming out, Doom Eternal or something like that. And you can see that in that game, you are seeing from the perspective of the simulated character. Your eyes, you can look down and see your body, see the gun in your hand. You can look around at the virtual environment. So we can easily uh, extrapolate or project to a virtual reality technology in 20 years or 50 years or 100 years where you can actually enter a three-dimensional virtual reality environment when you can look down at your simulated body, touch your simulated body, smell the simulated fragrance, <laughs> hold the simulated gun, uh, witness you know, your simulated monsters or whatever is going on there and your friends and all that. Uh, it's not hard to imagine, actually. So this is one of the powers of Maya, Praksait Patatmika Shakti, the ability to create a seamless experience of reality. But even if, even if we were able to create that, so let's say we go 20 years, 50 years, 100 years in the future, and we can go home after work or whatever, if that still exists, and we're sitting in a lounge room and we put on the virtual reality thing or whatever that looks like, we turn on the microchip in our head or whatever. <laughs> so there's still one last obstacle to being fully immersed in a simulation. So even if I cannot see, hear, taste, touch, or smell ground reality, and I can only perceive the virtual environment, there's one last obstacle to being fully immersed. That is, I can remember I can remember that a few minutes ago, I connected myself up to the VR machine. I can remember that my actual name is Madrea, and my parents are Art and Diane, and my friend is Gregory, and my brother is Scott, and I'm six foot two, and I live in Australia. I can remember all these mm, identities and, and um, ideas and thoughts and memories of ground reality. And in that sense, it breaks my full immersion because I'm aware at some level that I'm in a simulation. So Maya's second power, you can imagine this is presented thousands of years ago, is that she can take your memory entirely of your true self and ground reality. So you simply wake up in a baby's body with no memory of your true self, of ground reality, and you're only being presented with this virtual landscape around you, your own sort of baby simulated body, and it's so compelling that we simply believe it. We simply roll with it. <laughs> so this is the presentation of Sankhya philosophy uh, in the yoga tradition. Now, uh, finally, um, we come to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the presentation of the Ashtanga Yoga system that he presents there. Actually, there's many types of yoga, and yoga means to reconnect or to link back. Uh, and in this analogy, using modern language, you are linking back to ground reality. So your yoga means, this is yoga, to emancipate yourself from the simulated world and to connect back to the divine realm, to the ground reality, to your true self, what Patanjali calls your Swarupa, your own true form. Rupa means form. Uh, so when we look at the Ashtanga yoga process, one of the yoga processes, any, any process that would take you back to ground reality is by definition yoga. And there are many different bhakti, jnana, karma yoga, all these different yoga processes are given there. Uh, 
that suit different people in times and places, different processes. So Patanjali, 2,000 years ago, is presenting one of those, Ashtanga. Ashta is our English word octo, cognate with our linguistically related to our English word octo, or the Spanish, what is it, ocho? It just means eight. So ashta, eight. Anga is cognate, I believe it's cognate, with our English word limb. So the eight limbs, or the eight steps to go back to ground reality. This is the idea. Eight steps to take you back to ground reality. Ashtanga Yoga, presented in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. So the eight steps are Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. <laughs> so here is just a quick overview of the process. Yama, Niyama. First of all, become peaceful. That's required. Because this is going to be a deep meditative experience. So you can't do that with a scattered, distracted mind. So become peaceful. And that means becoming a good person with good relationships. So like the first principle, the first yama is ahimsa, non-violence, uh, suchi, cleanliness, purity. Um, I think that's socham. Actually, suchi is cleanliness, but socham, to be clean. Uh, truthfulness, sacham. Be honest, be fair, be non-violent, be forgiving, don't be greedy, don't steal, become a good person. So it's, it's almost like ethical, ethical considerations. Become peaceful, shanti, shanti, shanti. Then asana, we are going to utilize this vehicle of the simulated body, the mind body, to engage in a mechanical process of meditation. So now asana, we've got to get this body super fit, super flexible, optimized. We're going to get an optimized body. And of course, the body affects the mind and the mind affects the body. So we've got to, we've got to do that. So first ethical, then the body optimized, then pranayama, uh, the great science of breath work. So we're going to go to our Wim Hof seminar, <laughs> or we're going to go to Kundalini or Jiva Mukti or Iyengar Yoga, some of the yoga traditions that teach pranayama. We're going to uh, really get into the experience of how breath work affects um, this mind-body apparatus. BKS Iyengar, the head of the Iyengar Yoga School, um, maybe 15 years ago, he wrote me a letter and he uh, wrote to me, told me all about his life and different things. And he said that at that time, and he must have been I think he was 88 or 90, somewhere in there. He said that he was getting up at a certain time in the early morning and doing pranayama for two hours. And he'd been doing it for decades. So you can imagine the kind of um, capacity that he was developing. Anyway, if, um, if you want the very quick experience to get some taste of what pranayama can bring you, just go on YouTube and click on a Wim Hof uh, tutorial and just do the breathing. Ten minutes later, your whole body's going to be electric and your mind's going to be blown, and uh, you're going to get a taste for what pranayama can bring. So, yama niyama, I'm becoming a good, peaceful, happy, gentle person. Asana, the body's becoming optimized. Pranayama, I'm learning the breath work. And then, pratyahara, I'm going to withdraw the senses from the simulation. So traditionally, there are types of yoga where people get married and have families and live in society and do work, and there's so many types of yoga like that. But Ashtanga yoga traditionally was practiced alone, uh, and you're going into the forest, like a vana prasta, vana means forest, or you're going to, to a cave or a cottage or a, um, like some hermitage or something. So you could imagine you're you know, you're, you're going alone up into the wilderness, up into some cave or something, and your body is fully optimized. Your whole being is just electric with the breath work. You're peaceful. You're, you're, um, you're not holding grudges and anger and difficulties and conflicts. You've reached, uh, you've reached that, um, that stage 
And now you're going to sit down and you're going to withdraw the senses from the simulation. And then stage six, seven, and eight, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, you're going to choose a meditation on ground reality. So from Patanjali's historical context, he's calling that ishta deva. So ishta implies choice. So Patanjali is not pushing some like sectarian idea, you know, my, my uh, tradition, my group or something, not that. Um, whatever is your concept of, he uses the word deva, which is like divine. Whatever is your concept of the eternal divine realm uh, or the eternal divine person or something like that, your choice. Everybody has some idea. Um, and then dharana, dharana means to hold. So any of us who have tried meditation, you know that the mind can wander. <laughs> so we are going to hold on to that focus. Then we're going to dhyan, we're going to enter into a deeper state of meditation. And then finally samadhi, full trance, full absorption into ground reality. And then the yogi, at the time of his or her choosing, simply leaves the simulation and enters ground reality. <laughs> so this is the, the frame of yoga, and you can see how neatly it meshes with Sankhya. Traditionally, there are six orthodox darshans or schools of thought in the yoga tradition, in the broad yoga tradition, the Vedic tradition, you could say the South Asian sacred tradition, Sanskritic tradition. Two of them, they come in three sets of pairs, and two of them are yoga and sankhya. Yoga and the, the ontology of the simulation. And they go together in orthodox uh, Vedic teachings. Yoga and sankhya are always a pair. That's why if you study YTT, if you do a yoga teacher training, if you do study Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, you'll also, almost always um, learn something about sankhya as well, because they go together. Patanjali assumes Sankhya to be true. So I become a good person, a peaceful person. I become fully physically optimized. The mind body is just radiating electric energy. I'm, I'm in the zone. Then I find a solitary meditative place. I withdraw my mind and senses from the simulation. I focus on ground reality. I meditate on ground reality. Uh, deeper, 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 and finally, ground reality reveals itself to me, and I can enter ground reality and leave behind the simulation. <laughs> Just got somebody knocking on the door there. So, an overview we can see uh, yama, niyama, asan, pranayam, pratyahara, dharana, jhana, and samadhi. We're becoming good, we're becoming peaceful, gentle. We're getting the body fully optimized, then integrating the mind and body through the breath, becoming an electric, peaceful, gentle, meditative being. Then pratyahara, we're going to some solitary place, perhaps a cave, a hermitage, a cottage, whatever it is. We are withdrawing the mind and the senses from the simulation. Then we are choosing our ishta deva, our focus point of ground reality. Ishta means choice, Deva means divine. Uh, and in this case, from Patanjali's perspective, the divine realm, the Satchitananda realm, in different yoga traditions, it's Krishna Loka or Vishnu Loka or Vaikuntha Loka or the Brahman or Vaikuntha Loka, sorry, I said that one, or um, Satchitananda. Satchitananda means eternal, fully cognizant, fully blissful. So he's thinking of that in terms of the divinity of divine. So ground reality is the divine reality, the actual reality, the eternal reality. So now we've gotten our whole body and mind optimized. We've withdrawn the senses. We're no longer absorbed in seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling in the simulation. We're withdrawing the senses inward and then focusing the mind onto the divine uh, in whatever our tradition, ishta, you know, our choice, uh, whatever is the, the sacred 
divine ground reality, our best intelligence reveals to us, and then we are meditating there. So dharana means we are holding on to that meditation. So in the beginning it's assumed that our mind will wander, our mind will wander here and there. No, we, we hold on, we bring it back to our focus point. Then dhyana, interestingly enough, when that word dhyan, meditation, went east out of India with Buddhism, carried by Buddhism, um, in Japan it became Zen, dhyan became Zen. Uh, and then finally samadhi, full trance, full absorption, where we lose, it's sort of the reverse of how we got here. We lose all sensory awareness of the simulation and we enter fully into sensory experience of ground reality. Uh, Patanjali describes that as having two stages, with effort and without. <laughs> so initially that may require some effort. We're still applying some energy to hold on to that meditative trance and then eventually effortless. And then the yogi or yogini leaves their body, leaves the simulation at the time of their choosing and enters into the ground reality if they so desire. <laughs> so this is the yoga process as given to us. Now, um, just in conclusion, there's one book presented by an incredible scientist. Um, in our modern world, we hear words like wonderful, incredible, genius, spectacular, you know, all the, these words are there in the media every day. Uh, so I would, some, I would temper this. Um, this scientist, his name was Dr. Richard Thompson. Um, he passed away a few years ago now in September 2008. Um, but he was an amazing personality, both a very serious decades-long practicing yogi and also an incredible scientist, genius scientist. Uh, his PhD was in mathematics, I think from Cornell. Um, but it seemed like anything that he turned his mind to, the incredible um, sort of shining light of his intellect, he could just place it biology, chemistry, astronomy, physics, uh, philosophy, history, anthropology, archaeology, geology, anywhere he put that incredible brain, um, it simply illuminated the field of that, that mm, sphere of academia, academia. And he wrote a book called Maya, The World as Virtual Reality. And in that book, he presents um, a little bit more uh, rigorously in terms of the technical scientific data, um, he presents the case for this world being a simulation and the nature of the self and the nature of ground reality and so on. So that book is called Maya, the World as Ground, uh, Maya, the World as Virtual Reality uh, by Dr. Richard Thompson. I'll leave a link in the description below. I have no financial connection with that, but um, it's just a wonderful book. And if you would like to pursue this line of thought, it is, um, it's amazing and uh, can have a deep impact both on the self and the community of selves, which is human civilization. So My Other World is Virtual Reality by mm, Dr. Richard Thompson. And um, other than that, my dear friends, it's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation. Uh, thank you so much. We're just starting this channel, um, the Heart and Soul uh, Media or Heart and Soul Yoga Life channel. If you like it, please, please uh, like and subscribe. All right. Thank you very much.